Hi, everybody. This is Tony Khan, the producer and director of Morning Stories from WGBH in Boston. We all know the phrase losing face, right? We hear a lot about it in the news. It's the act of losing your status or your standing among your peers. But what happens when you lose your face, not symbolically, but for real, through an accident or an illness or a birth defect that's so disfiguring that even your best friends find it hard to look at you without shock or or fear or disgust? What does it mean to be hit by something so physically and socially disabling? And how do you recover from it? Today's morning story is about a plastic surgeon in England named Ian Hutchinson, his patients, and the unique form of treatment that he came up with that literally made them all better. We call today's morning story, Saving Faces. Um, In November 1992, I was uh, attacked. I'd come out from a Chinese takeaway. The guy pushed me, and I scolded myself with the soup. I chased after him, and he led me into a trap with six other guys with baseball bats who uh, beat upon my head and fractured my skull. Uh, They had to operate fast. The friend that was in the ambulance... What I had was a toothache. My dentist could not remove it because I had an abscess. I was sent to the hospital. They could come right up to it. He said, well, you have cancer, but it is spreading rapid. They said they were going to cut up under the nose, around and underneath the eye, all the upper jaw. Besides their trauma, Londoners Chris Pablo and Roland Scott have something else in common, the surgeon that saved their lives and reconstructed their faces. Ian Hutchinson. I'm what's called an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. What it means is people who've been in car crashes, people who've been assaulted and had facial injuries, cancer. If you change somebody's face, you change their psyche because of the way people look at you or the way you feel people look at you. I looked like a psycho. I had a scar going from ear to ear across a, a bald head, an eye that had slightly dropped. Um, a horrific scar on my forehead, which was constantly weeping. You could say, God, that man is so hard, you, you don't want to mess with him. And it was completely the opposite, because on the inside I was shaking, literally. I had to have radiotherapy, and that was worse, believe it or not. They make a plastic mask, and to make that mask, they come up, they give you a tube to breathe through, and like a little straw, and they come in a whole face in this, like, jelly and then cover that in plaster of Paris. Your nose is blocked, your eyes are covered, you can't see, you're very hard to breathe, and you are totally and utterly on your own, and it is terrifying. There's no other word for it. Terrifying. Roland surgeon Ian Hutchinson deals with the external scars of trauma, but he knows that for a full cure, far deeper wounds have to be treated too. His mother, a doctor, fled the Nazis from Austria in 1938. He grew up in an apartment over her office, influenced by her passion for medicine and music and painting. When she died a few years ago, he took the money she left and applied it to an even greater legacy, her belief that people need medicine and art to be well. He set up a program for a hospital artist in residence, and he hired a Scottish portraitist named Mark Gilbert to paint his patients before, after, and even during surgery. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. To see the the head, which is such a sort of sensitive area at the best of times, you know, opened up in such a in such a sort of brutal way, really. You know, if I do a, a normal portrait, you're taking a normal face, you'd turn that into something special. That's your aim. Whereas here, you're not having to make it more special, you're almost having to do justice to the subject that you're dealing with. What I said to Mark at the outset was, look, you've got a free reign to do whatever you want uh, and help the patients come through what is probably the most emotional event of their lives. I just want you to paint faces. Just paint faces. Some of the most hideous faces in the world. Every day... The, the secretaries would come in to see Mark painting. The patients used to come up and see other people being painted. So Mark became a kind of fulcrum around which we all revolved. When Mark done the paintings, I had to relive the night to tell him the story, yeah? Brought up a lot of things. Um, how I felt now, what do I feel about the people that, that have beaten me up? It was, it was a relief, really. It became, for me, a therapy. Knowing that he knew what I was going through, it 
I don't know, it, it just makes you better. It, it really does help to, to heal you. It, you know, I wouldn't have got through it without it. Yeah, it absolutely surprised me. Each time I would think I would be going too far, the patients themselves would say, no, we want to see it carry on. He felt valued, which was terrific. He was acting like a counsel. He was listening to the patients. They were telling him things they wouldn't tell their own family, um, anybody else. The patients love me and adore me, which is why I'm doing this in the first place. Um, and they very often don't want to say to me, Doctor, I'm not very happy about this, or I'm not very happy about that, because they feel it's hurtful to me. I began to understand much, much more about what affected them and what helped them and what didn't help them. Mark had originally thought his portraits might end up in a medical school. But galleries in England and Europe were interested in putting them on display. And last year, a selection opened to the public at London's prestigious National Portrait Gallery. I was unsure as to how the exhibition was going to be received, that it could just be seen as, you know, a sort of chamber of horrors or a sort of, as a sort of gratuitous kind of freak show or something like that. People have said it's disgusting, said it's not art. And I, I reply, well, what is it then if it's not art? A woman at the uh, National Portrait Gallery said to me, why did you do it? And I said, well, why not? The surgeon saved my life. The least I can do is sit while somebody paints me, surely. <laughs> you know, I explained everything that I went through and how it helped me. And I think I go away a bit more enlightened. I think... When I, when I tell the story to people and when I tell them what happened, you can see that they're amazed and, and they look at you as if say, wow, you, you came through that. What, what, what is your power? And I said, well, I'm not Superman. You know, everyone has got the power within them to deal with life's problems. At the National Portrait Gallery, there must have been about, without exaggerating, maybe about a 1,000 comments, and there was about five that felt that it was maybe inappropriate. And I can remember there was one that wrote, her husband had thrown acid in her face and she'd written all about her experiences, how she felt about the exhibition. And then her last line was that she was now going home to do a self-portrait. You can become a very, very angry person and you can want to seek revenge. Um, I took a different path. I grew up with conflict. My mother's side of the family is Irish uh, from the north. But wars everywhere. My dad was Greek Cypriot and he lost his land and everything due to the Turkish invasion in, in 74. And um, I said to him once, you know, you've got to let this go. You've really got to let it go because it would kill you. And he said, son, I can never let it go. I can never for forget. And it did kill him. And I learned through that that I had to let this go completely. Sometimes you just think, oh. What next? What else is going to come up? But you get through it, you know. Would you have rather that none of this had ever happened to you? No, no. I was uh, very self-centred, you know. Me and that was it, me and my family. And as far as I was concerned, the rest of the world never existed. But now it's uh, it totally changed my life around. Life's not kind to anybody. You have to take your chance. And deal with it. You went through a traumatic time, but you got through it with the help of others. Pass it on to other people. That's today's morning story, Saving Faces. That was a piece that I did uh, a while ago for a public radio show called The World, and somehow it's one of those stories that strikes me as being ultimately about the power of story. I'm here with uh, Gary Mott in the studio. Uh, Gary, one of the uh, victims of this said in, in the course of this, and it really struck me hearing it again, knowing that someone else knows what you're going through makes it better. You get a chance to know what it's like to be the other guy, and the other guy gets a chance to know that you know it. And that in itself is healing. It's, it's good medicine. And the power of forgiveness. You know, So many people are crippled by wrongs done to them mm, in their past mm, mm. and just the the freedom that comes from forgiving someone um, that jumped out of me too 
Letting go. Yeah. Letting go. You know, and also giving back. And the other part of the story that struck me was that these people who had all been seen as victims were actually given an opportunity to give back to the public by teaching them what the process was like. And that was a very important part of their feeling better. Giving is not a one-way street. If the person who gets doesn't have the opportunity to give something back to you, they're going to feel a little bit less than human. I think the, the genius of Ian Hutchinson's part was that he figured there was a lot he didn't know about what he thought he was an expert at. And the only way that he could find out about it was to bring in an artist. What a, what a great idea. Artist in residence. Artist in residence I anywhere. I've always wanted to be, and if anybody is listening and wants to give a grant, I'm all for it, to be the artist in residence in Congress for a year. I'd like to spend a year just getting everybody in Congress to tell me one story about something that happened to them that was really significant. Forget about the politics and whether they're left or right, Republican, Democrat, Independent. Just tell me a story. And those collective stories, I think, might actually help people understand a little bit better about what's really going on. When you do have that grant, <laughs> <laughs> the first question you ask, Yeah, right. when was the last time you forgave someone? Yeah, what a great question, Gary. You have a piece of mail there that we got from someone. Yeah, right? I do. I do. We got a great letter from Charlie Chu um, in the Seattle area. Thanks for your great program. I listen to you each week via podcast as I commute to work on my bike. I work in Seattle and live on Bashan Island in the South Puget Sound. Oh, that's beautiful. It's, it's gorgeous. Where access is limited to ferry boat only. So how does he bike to work in Seattle? <laughs> I enjoy the incredible beauty of the Olympic Mountains and sound as I ride in each day, and the views are perfectly complemented by your uplifting personal tales. Oh, Keep up the great work. Thanks a lot. Thanks, I, Charlie. I was just out in Seattle. We were doing a taping for a show called Says You. I asked a local guy who happened to be a jazz musician. I said, so listen, what's one thing I should look for that I would never notice about Seattle if I didn't live here for a long time? And he said, <laughs> snapping his fingers, he said, well, man, he said, got to understand. He said that everything on the surface here looks pretty, pretty laid back and quiet. He said, but look a little bit deeper, and it's really crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I kept my uh, my eyes open, and I saw a lot of like really crazy stuff, you know, like a real spirit of independence and and artistry uh, in Seattle. So I was delighted to be out there. So in real time, not podcast time, in real time, this is the day before Thanksgiving the biggest travel day in the year. So please, all of you, if you're listening to this in real time, be careful when you're driving. And while we're on the subject of Thanksgiving, I can't proceed further without rendering deep thanks onto the source of our own stuffing week after week. The people who have supported this podcast pretty much since the start, Ipswich, a leader in file transfer software. You can reach them at ipswitch.com. Be safe, be full, be thankful. We're thankful to you. And we want to give a shout out to our pals Alex and Lori from Ipswich. We uh -huh. had a great lunch with them yesterday, even if I did pay. Um, <laughs> and if you have some spare time this weekend, and who doesn't in between football games and uh, snow and whatever else comes your way, our website, wgbh.org slash morning stories. And send us an email. We love hearing from you. Morning stories at wgbh.org. Thanks, everybody, and be sure to check in next Friday for another podcast. Uh, we'll see you then.